Welcome to the Calgary Sessions. This is episode number 30. I'm your host, Jeff Humphreys. Today's guest is going to be a fun conversation. Him and I go back a while now. Yeah. Uh, we met water skiing, which is, you know, once you meet somebody water skiing, you're kind of lifelong buds. Yep. And so, yeah, this will be a cool conversation because I know his backstory a little bit, but I don't know the full story. So I'll let him introduce himself, name, and uh, where he's working. I'm Doug Rollick. Uh, been working in Calgary for a long time, since mid-'80s. Uh, building custom homes, kind of got into the home building business back in early 80s, I guess, as a kid, and just stuck with it ever since. Here we are. And here we are, yeah. Um, yeah. And when you say early 80s building, you know, my 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 memory of the early 80s is my dad building our first home. Yeah. 81, 82, interest rates are at 19, 20%. Yeah, plus or minus. <laughs> yeah. Dad's yeah. working five jobs trying to build, it, <laughs> build the house up in Strathcona. Yeah. So I can imagine when you were starting in the early 80s, it was... Very interesting. It was lean and mean, for sure. Yeah, I mean, a lot of small projects. We did a lot of government work, actually, is what it was. A like lot what of kind of? Subsidized housing. No way. So that's really so not what, glamorous. That drove the market really all over, well, say central Saskatchewan is where I did most of the work. Yep. So we were kind of really big nursing homes, uh, small subsidized housing homes, yep. like all over small town Saskatchewan. Just bringing them back up to speed? No, actually building them. Brand new little 800 square foot, 900 square foot houses, like mm. these tiny little homes that... The government would supply at a lower rental rate yep. in all these small towns. You build two, three houses, two, three houses, little towns like Blaine Lake, I mean, Hudson Bay, <laughs> all over the place. Crazy. And, and kind of anybody in that lower income bracket could rent them. So that was a start. Yeah. And that's kind of learned about production, learned about government specifications. Mm -hmm. All of it. <laughs> big, big books of specifications. Yep. Yeah. That was interesting. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I, I told you before, off camera, I said, you know, the gist of the show is I'd like the guests to go back as far as they want to go. So sure. I'd love for you to, you know, think back to when you were growing up, you know, how you grew up, where your influences were, sure. you know, whether it was interested in sports or, you know, the choice of not, you know, becoming a builder versus being an engineer, like all of it. So go back, go back to the point where you kind of <laughs> remember where things started to click for you. Yeah, I guess it's really, I'm going to say, the building gene was, I guess, in my system right from day one. I've been taking it apart and building things since I was old enough to remember, honestly. I mean, whether it was building dirt roads in, in the garden with little cars or mm -hmm. whatever it was, mm -hmm. my entire life I've been building something and then kind of got into some woodworking stuff through 4-H as a kid. Yep. And I was probably about, I guess, eight or nine years old then, old enough to barely use tools. Yep. And really just kind of got into that part of it didn't really love it really was more interested in automotive and kind of more of that type of work at an early age yeah early and, and what were your parents like were they into that what like, goes your were they doing but, anything you know, well i guess yeah so dad ran heavy equipment okay and really we had a small we'll call it a hobby farm yep so we had i want to say laying hands so we had a little we'll say uh yeah i guess really just a farm to table <laughs> type operation where we actually yep take product to stores and mm -hmm. and sell the product that, that we had grown on the farm. So so it's kind of interesting, you know, farmers markets, things like that. Yep. So I kind of learned a little bit of that entrepreneurial mm -hmm. piece and watched it. I remember riding in the back seat with, you know, cases of eggs going to deliver them to all these people all over the place. Crazy. Like weird. I remember hot as hell in the summertime, you'd be driving around this car <laughs> unloading eggs in all these <laughs> places. Like, you know, can we go buy something now? <laughs> no, we, we just got our money. We're going home. We're going to pay rent. Yeah, exactly. Like mortgages, yeah. whatever That's it is. That's right. Groceries or whatever. It was all about the necessities. And that, I would say that really, I guess, taught me a lot about, you know, that gave us all of our extras. Mm. You know, dad, dad worked for the municipality, so it was a pretty lean Mm -hmm. you know, wage. He was, he was farming a little bit with his parents at the time, my grandparents. Yeah. But, you know, just kind of watching all of that, the work ethic, it's, it's amazing. It's like way different on the farm, right? When you watch people work, it's just, it doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. Our neighbors were, where I spent about half my childhood across the road, half a mile away. Because why? Buddies over there or just your parents? Buddies, we went to school together oh, yeah. and, you know, there was uh, four boys. I mean, it was just, paradise mm -hmm. I mean between you know hunting gophers and doing all the stuff that kids can do and it was kind of a free-for-all there the parents weren't I want to say strict yeah but you know if within limits don't wreck anything and they're all they're all pretty good with that yeah but you still had your chores to do responsibility never left mm -hmm. so whatever you did till five o'clock when the chores had to happen yeah everything stopped they had dairy cattle mm -hmm. you want to talk about hard work work, work. that's the hardest job on the planet like mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't leave that unattended for minutes. <laughs> That's, it's got to be locked in. Yeah. You know, 455, you're, you're on. Mm -hmm. The game's on for two hours and away you go again. So it's just really interesting kind of growing up that way. And it was yep. a very rudimentary 
farm. Yep. So I got to see everything from, you come home after school and there, there'd be a hog hanging up that they had just butchered that day. Crazy. You know, so yep. that's just what I grew up just with. Exposed we to had it. chickens, same thing. You come home and there's a bunch of chickens yep. that are getting butchered and Oh, that's just part of life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as totally. a kid, it was kind of good to see that. I wish more kids could see that now, honestly. Just to understand it. You just don't have a clue mm. where anything comes from and mm-hmm. appreciation of it. Yep. You know, you never you never leave your meat on the table. <laughs> 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 that poor thing was walking around three days ago. You know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you know. Okay. Different. It. Yeah, very different. So, yeah. you know, do you actually, like, remember when you were little, like, building things in the mechanical side of things? Like, that, yeah. that caught your... Like you just had some, you put some energy towards that to figure it out? I, anything. Like, and it was just kind of interesting from building tree forts to we built an outdoor hockey rink at the neighbors, like mm-hmm. for the summer, because there wasn't a hockey rink in town. So we had to build our own hockey rink and just mm. weird stuff like that. So we yep. always had something on the go. And I guess, you know, that was always very easy. I guess so it came you natural? To, yeah, it just came natural. So I never had to really think too hard about it. So, you know, it just, it just, I was gravitated towards it, I guess, just because mm-hmm. that's how I'm wired. And to this yep. day, I'm still wired the same way. Like it never, yep. so I said it was in the genes of somewhere along the way of mm-hmm. you, 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 the mechanical aspect, I guess, just mechanical mindset. Yep. I probably could have fallen into engineering or something like that because I very method. my mind works very methodically. Yep. Just like process. I see the problems and, and process them very quickly and easily. Yep. So it's just. How it is. I mean, I, I don't think I could have learned that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I really don't think that was a possibility. I think it was more just a matter of it was just there. Yep. It was just built in. So, so and then <clears throat> growing up, was it, you know, did you did you go to school for, you got your, you got your ticket, yeah? Yeah. So I'm actually. Did you know? Did you know, like, in high school what you wanted to do? I didn't, actually. That was, uh, I remember, you know, career fairs and things like that. It was mm-hmm. small school. I mean, tiny, tiny school. There was, like, 10 people in a class, so. <laughs> Again, small town. So two classes together, you know. So yep. you know, eleven or twelve. Every you know, every two grades would be stuck together at mm-hmm. the hip. But really, even that at that time, there was a lot of push towards professions. So Talk. if you weren't going in to become a doctor or a teacher, something very linear like that, mm-hmm. then I remember going to you know U of S at the time, going for tours and things like that. We never did go to Kelsey Institute. It was the tech school at the time. We never went there, which was really interesting because. You, you look at a small town farming community, most of the people is, are very technical. And I, and I would say probably two thirds of the class ended up going there for some something, whether it was water sciences, a couple yep. of friends went through that, uh, nursing, all of that happened mm-hmm. at, we'll say it's Lake State. Mm. It's the same type of technical school. Yep. So that's where all of that happened, which was very interesting. And, and in high school in a small town, we weren't even exposed to that, which blows my mind because... You get all these kids that are really fixing tractors and yeah. working on the farm and working very physically. And it's like, hmm, not going to expose us to that. Hey, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's quite interesting. Yeah. So I, I actually started after school. It was just an after school job when I was about 15. Uh, on a job site? On, on a job site. So I had worked uh, randomly, co- just somebody you knew? Yeah, really randomly. Because I'd, I'd done a couple summers. I helped a neighbor who used to repair cars. So that was right up my alley. And that was, I was literally 13 years old. Went and worked for him for about a month and a half in the summer. Mm-hmm. Next summer, same thing. And he would buy these, you know, written off cars and fix them and put them back on the road. Sell them again and put them back on the road. So hmm. it was good. Got to learn how to really tear cars apart, spray, yeah. paint. It's like <laughs> early. It's oh, early, hey? Early, like early. Yeah, it was like first job, man, 13. Hmm. You know, and I didn't even blink. That was just what you did. Hmm. All my friends were working on the farm. They were all working like full time by that point. Yep whether it was grain farming or animals, or whatever they had. So, so to me, it was just, that was just normal to have a, like a summer job. Yeah. You didn't have a job. Like, man, <laughs> what's going on? Yeah. So, and then I would think it was, well, yeah, I was 15 and some friends of my parents were building a house and they needed a, just somebody to give them a hand. Yep. Um, so they had hired a contractor. So the contractor hired me as a, as a kid and I, I worked for them. We're really starting in the summer holidays and then I worked for them up until Christmas time till the house was finished. Doing everything like moving lumber. Actually, we did. We we I start when I started there. We were still framing. Okay. So we went through the framing stage. Then we put a really the interiors together. Put the drywall in. Um, we hired people for cabinets and flooring and things like that. Mm-hmm. But we just about did every piece of that house, including a bunch of paneling work, mm-hmm. almost everything, siding. So that was the first. That, that was, was the first job I ever worked on. Actually, as a construction worker. And what, what did you know then that this was? 
I liked it. It was, it was just like, <laughs> it, was like it, it was just like, yeah, I like this. And then it gets the freedom of it to be able to kind of be really free all day. Yeah. You know, versus I was really not great sitting in a chair all day. Yeah. So for me to be able to be moving around and free and burning my excess energy, because I had a little bit of extra energy, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit stored up there. So we had to get rid of some of that. So, yep. you know, really, <laughs> my parents, I'm sure, were very thankful. Good, you go, you go get go a good around. physical job. Yeah, yeah. So it worked out really well. And then there was a big debate because I turned 16 that fall, and then there was a big debate, so I started again the next summer. And then that next fall, when I turned 17, that's when I decided I'm going to leave high school. You left? I left high school after grade 11. Yeah, okay. so I finished grade 11. And at Based that on time, you weren't interested? You're like actually, this. I signed up for apprenticeship. No way. You only needed your grade 10, and you need to be 16 years old at that time. So Done. I'm like, you know what? It's either another year of high school or jump into this right now. So I started my apprenticeship really young. So you knew? Like I was 18 the first time I went. No way. Yeah. Yeah. So I was this, this little kid, <laughs> all these big construction men. workers <laughs> show, showed up at Kelsey. And yeah, it was pretty interesting. Yeah. Hmm. And... You knew you like you knew that first no, project. Not even was, a question. No, you, yeah, there was no question. Yeah. And your and that decision to to leave at grade eleven. Yeah. Family was like, wow, they were really you, you were going to it school. Was, it was a standoff, and really the funny part was they said, well, if you stay in school, we'll buy you a car. I said, well, if I go to work, I'll buy my own car. Got you there. What happened? <laughs> <So> <laughs> it really became pretty. Yeah. yeah, and they were okay with it. They never hmm. pushed back and. You know, again, it was that type of community that, you know, you weren't, there was no line between, you know, what you did for a living. Because, mm -hmm. mo again, most of the people had a pretty, I want to say, pretty simple lifestyle. Yep. So to go into carpentry or construction, <laughs> you know, at that time was a, was a great job. I mean, really to become a tradesman at that time, mm -hmm. it really was a, is a great, it was a great job. So. And how long was that program? Actually, it was three years. So, and so it was. Traditional, so they, like school they, time, work time, yeah, school they, time? Yeah, they shrunk it. They actually put more per year in our class. Mm -hmm. So they pushed us through really quick. And I don't know why they did it. It was a very short spell. Mm -hmm. Now it's four years. It always has been. Yep. None of us had our hours. The guys that, like, I had just started, so I had no hours. By the time I wrote my journeyman's, I think I had to work for two more years to get my t my ticket. Wow. Because I have short hours. Yep. You know, so it was kind of interesting. It's kind of, this is, wasn't a really well-planned mm -hmm. program to shrink it by that much when you need four years worth of hours, yeah. at least. It's the only time, yeah. You yeah, literally need 8,000 hours, yeah. <laughs> which is four plus. Usually guys will work a year, then start. So by the time you, you're yeah. done your fourth year, you, you're pretty much you're topped there. up on hours and experience. I remember writing that test thinking, I don't know what this stuff is. There was shipbuilding on the test. No way. The carpentry, it's Saskatchewan. <laughs> Honestly, you know where we are. Oh yeah. <laughs> Did any of you read this test? Yeah, it's crazy. It's hilarious. So really, yeah, I got through that, and then I ended up going from because I was kind of working small town still, kind yep. of around Rosetown. Mm -hmm. So I'd apprenticed there for a couple of years, and then one of the guys I went to school with framing, doing everything, what kind of stuff? Doing everything, renovations, okay. like small town Brock, actually, a little we both the same town town as I grew up in. Yep. Small little town, kind of by Rosetown, Kingsley area. Okay. But really, it was all renovating these, you know, farmers' homes, farmers' homes. So kind of a little bit of everything. Honestly, I learned how to tile. We learned how to paint, drywall, oh, yeah. just about everything. Really mm -hmm. was quite good. Yep. And then, you know, really that kind of ran its course. Got really tired of living out of a suitcase in a small town. Yep. Uh, nothing to do, you know, mm -hmm. 18, 19 years old. Is yep. Not a lot of action in Bronx, mm -hmm. Saskatchewan. Yeah, I can totally. tell you. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, your if you're not rodeoing or doing something <laughs> like that, <laughs> there's not much going on. Yeah. So, so I ended up getting a job. So Tim, the guy I went to school with, right from day one, we went to the same. Every year we went January, February. Mm -hmm. So we got to know each other on day one. We actually sat beside each other the first day, first year. It's like, hey, hey. <laughs> so we became pretty good friends over yep. the course. So he got me a job in Humboldt, actually. And I guess that would have been for my third year. So I'd put about two and a half years in by then. Mm -hmm. And then he got me a job there with them. And that was straight framing. So then we went straight framing. And I absolutely loved it. Mm. That was just, that I found home. This, mm. The pace, the yep. the weather, everything, just being outside, moving yep. around. It was just fit me to a T. So. But the, the one thing, like I've been on, I grew up on job sites. Dad built homes for yep. 30 years. So, <laughs> yep. you know, I did a lot of work in, you know, moving lumber. Nothing skilled. I was definitely not skilled labor. I was the grunt. Yeah. But it's, I always found it interesting that the day, as the day progresses and all of a sudden, you know, two walls go up and then they're like, yeah, they're, they're fastened to the floor and you go home. Like that seemed 
it's, talk about rewarding, mm-hmm. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, like it, walls. It is, and you and you, you know, and it gets to a point too where it's like you get your systems down, and you just know mm-hmm. you can do X mm-hmm. amount a day. Mm-hmm. You know, and you've always got these. I mean, I guess I'm a goal oriented person, so you always have these targets. You yep. start, you know, okay, if I do that that way, mm-hmm. I can do a little bit faster, mm-hmm. a little bit faster, a little bit faster. And they, they, the company I worked for there really pushed a lot of that. And a good bunch of, like, really good bunch of people to encourage and push you. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, you get yelled at, but it was all in, mm-hmm. all all for the better. Like, yeah. you just, I just got better and better as a tradesman. So by the time I was done there, really was quite a good tradesman. You were armed. Yeah, fully. Because they, they set me loose as a um, foreman when I was, no, oh, geez. 20. Oh, yeah. So Tim left. He went off with his brothers. Mm-hmm. So they started a company, asked me to go with them. Yep. Um, I declined. And then I rolled in his position at the lumber mart where I was working. So mm-hmm. so I moved into Tim's job, which was a really running crew. So it was actually pretty funny because I had guys working for me. They were in their 40s. No way. And I was I was their boss. And they still listen to you? So they're absolutely. No way. I was a guy with a plan. <laughs> All you got to be is the guy with the plaid. <laughs> so <laughs> it, was, it was really funny. And I, I just still, I'll never forget, like just, you know, all the, kind of all these guys and you're directing traffic. All, and we were, they sent us up, I think we were in Calvington, middle of nowhere, Saskatchewan again, kind of, I want to say north central, I guess, kind of yep. a little bit on the, a little bit on the eastern half. We kind of, most people know where Calvington's from. Half the hockey players in the NHL are from Calvington. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember working on these 12 suite units. Uh, you know, big units, and they're just like, well, you guys go out and frame those. The last job I had was in Winyard. We were doing a 12-suite nursing home. Government contract. Mm. I mean, here's this kid. <laughs> you know, I, to this day, I still, I obviously, a lot of trust in, mm-hmm. in what I knew and what I could do, but mm-hmm. yeah, here you go. There's your crew. There's your truck. There's your tools. Figure it out. There's going to be a superintendent on site that stands in the shack and reads plans all day. Mm-hmm. So I always had a backup, so yep. I wasn't on my own, but yep. it was really interesting. Like, it was just that... Mm. I guess there's a mindset. The trades were young. We were all young. There was mm-hmm. a bunch of young guys. You know, was, 40 was kind of, you know, the, if you were 40 something, either you were on your own somewhere yep. or you were doing something like you weren't working for somebody at that mm-hmm. time. It's very interesting. Different. You know, we were all kind of, yeah, young and wiry and going. Yeah. And we need more of that. <laughs> <laughs> I need somebody that's way different. Really. And there's some great young guys out there. I just yep. wish that, yeah. More. It's, it's a good job. So when you, um, when you talked about that, the, the speed and kind of the efficiencies. Yeah. I always remember my dad doing that too. Yeah. He, he was always, he was always very matter of fact of that. It took this amount of time to put up four walls and a roof. Yeah. Like it was down to the to the hour. Yeah. It's it, twelve it, hours to do these four things and that's roof right. on. Yeah. It was just. Yeah. W- why is that a thing? Is it just becoming efficient? Is it becoming like what do you? That's that's a good question. Why is it a thing? Um, is it like it's it's a conversation, right? Like it's a it's a drive, and I and I guess I. I guess I've always been, it's a reward to me to do, to, to, we'll say hit a target yep. and then move the target, hit the target again, right. move the target again. And I guess that's something that, that's part of the job because some of it, once you do it 150 times mm. or 2000 times or whatever it is, it gets a little monotonous. Yep. So maybe that's the game, mm. you know, and maybe that's just the mindset of to stay active. Now, now it's a game of how fast can I do this? Yeah. How many, how few mistakes can yep. you make? How quick can you get the job done? Yeah. And also it's piecework too. So I did, yeah. I you really was working on piecework for a long time. I did a ton of projects when, after I moved here, it was all piecework. Mm-hmm. So then it's so on, really on the now it's on me. So, yep. you know, the faster we could go through a house, yep. you know, the more cash you put in your pocket. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that was another good reason to be fast. <laughs> <laughs> totally. You know, and, and I think the trade industry is based on piecework though at the core. Yeah. Like anybody that bids a job for a fixed fee, yep. you have to hit a target. For sure. And I think that's lost with a lot of people that haven't had that, we'll say that raw experience of whatever you get done today, you get paid for. Mm-hmm. That really is a lost art, I would say. Yep. And, and I see it in a lot of people that we've worked with over, over the years. Just different, they just grew up in a different time? I, I don't different know. Experiences? Or maybe, maybe it wasn't a thing. I think if the money's good, it becomes less of a thing. Yeah. You know, and, I, and I've watched that and I've watched... You know, especially framing, I kind of know how long things should take. Mm-hmm. You know, two, three guy, you know, three yeah, guys roughly, on a crew. You yeah. know, three man crew is a pretty typical framing mm-hmm. crew. You know, you should be able to put about a thousand square feet a week together. There's a good yeah, answer. There's some numbers. <laughs> yeah, there's, some, yeah. <laughs> there's a hard number, and if yeah. you can't put a thousand square feet a week together, you know, either it's super complicated, which then you get a little bit more time and money yep. for it. Yep. But if it's a fairly straightforward build, you better be able to produce that, mm-hmm. or you're not making any money. Mm-hmm. 
So mm -hmm. when things are really great, you know, heavy on the, I want to say lots of profit, lots of money in the jobs, if it takes you two weeks, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Everybody's still getting paid what they want to get paid. Yeah. I never looked at it that way. If I was making $30 an hour, why not make 50? Totally. Go. Go. <laughs> exactly. Why? <laughs> why I slow down because the money's better. <laughs> yeah, totally. Go faster if the money's better. <laughs> totally. Different mindset. So it, yeah. Yeah, It'll forever be stuck <laughs> in my brain because, yep. you know, even the conversation around how much material is left on the job site, you yes. know, like how, how precise the order was. That's like, right. I got two extra two by fours and that's it. And the house uh -huh. is up. Like that's, a, that's also that's like a good a, day. Yeah. How big is the waste pile? That's you know, those, those things. And, I, yeah. and again, that's something I look at. Some guys are really good. You mm -hmm. know, one of our framers right now, I worked with them. When I moved here, we were working together. Wild. Two different crews mm -hmm. working for the same company. And he still works that way. It's awesome. We get along so good. We fight a little bit. But we mm -hmm. get along good because, you know, he wants his material like now because yep. he's trying to produce. Yep. And I get that, you know, and mm -hmm. I appreciate it. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to drive there and get you whatever yeah. you need right now. Totally. <laughs> yeah. So kind of interesting. Funny. When, um, <laughs> how long, so when you, when you, when did you make the move? Did you move to Calgary to start your own thing or did you move to Calgary to work with somebody and then it all changed? Okay. That's, well, that's another interesting. So, <laughs> so I guess it was, I guess 85, Christmas of 85. I'm going to go way back. No way. <laughs> way back. Christmas. So I came through. And a cousin of mine knew a guy that was looking for somebody in construction in high rises, actually. They're renovating high rises. Mm -hmm. Pretty lean here in 85. There's yeah. not much going on. Mm -hmm. So I went and interviewed with the guy. I had a meeting with him downtown and had a chat with him. And he's like, seemed like you got a good resume. You've, you know, done your fair share of, you know, renovations and everything else. I'm like, yeah, it's all good. And so he said, oh, just let me see what I've got coming up. So I left it at that and continued on to BC to visit some relatives over Christmas, came back. He's like, yeah, I just, I just don't have anything. I really, you know, we barely have enough to keep the guys we have busy. Mm -hmm. So he kind of just said, you know, I, I don't have anything else. And I think it was about a week or so later, I, you know, barely got back to, to Humboldt where I was living at the time. And he had called me and he said, actually, my neighbor might need a framing contractor, like might need a framer. And I'm like, huh, interesting. So I called this Lauren guy <laughs> out of the blue, never met the man. <laughs> <laughs> we have a probably an hour long conversation on the phone, kind of what have you done? What are you doing now? You know, the same old yep. construction guy, a little test here, a little test there. It's mm -hmm. always interesting. Mm -hmm. you know, what have you been working on? <laughs> <laughs> so, so basically he hired me over the phone. No way. So the interesting part of what the, we'll say the carrot he dangled uh, was you, you, you'll be on piecework. So what he did was he did a 60, 40 split. So he would take 60%, pay WCB, all the, you know, fasteners, whatever else we had to supply. Yep. Including, and then what we did is we would split a helper's wage. So if we paid somebody, you know, a thousand bucks or whatever it was, yep. that came out of both of, ours pay, both of our paychecks off the top. Mm -hmm. Then we split everything 60, 40. Hmm. So it was a pretty attractive deal. Yep. I, I made better money right out the gate, mm -hmm. but then you're re depending on work. So there was glitches in the work. Yep. So we, you know, be busy, then stall out. But mm -hmm. remember the first job we had was way up in Prominence Point. No way. It was brand new. No way. Brand new. The hill was, the hill was empty up there. <laughs> yeah, so really, this is before all the Olympic housing yep. and all that stuff happened up mm -hmm. there. So a person, they know, insurance guy was building this massive house that was overlooking downtown. My first day on the job, I show up, I'm like, <laughs> wow. Like, you know, downtown view, yeah. working on this big custom home. And mm -hmm. it was just, couldn't have been better. I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. yeah, I'm here to stay. And the funny thing was, six months later, there's hardly any work. No way. So that fall, I ended up going back. I was going to go to Toronto. I was really busy in Toronto. Really? Big money, big money. Everybody's making big money in Toronto. Could you have done that? When, like when you think about it now, like that yeah, the lifestyle out east? Uh, I could have for a while. I, really, the more research I did, yeah, you're making eight, ten grand a month, which sounded like back in the mid-80s, like holy crap, yeah, like, that's, that's crazy money. Yep. But guys were paying three, four thousand dollars a month for a horrible little apartment mm -hmm. if you could get one. Yep. And then you had to pay union dues, whether you belong to the union or not. They didn't care. You're mm -hmm. paying union. And <laughs> the expenses started racking up, so I started doing the math. And then in the meantime, I got as far as Saskatchewan, back to my parents' place. They asked me to do a little bit of work for them. Did that. Then I got hired by a guy in Saskatoon, and and that was a kind of a weird story through a friend. So started working with this Bob, <laughs> Bob the Builder, obviously. <laughs> so so I contracted 
I started contracting for him. Framing? So, yeah. So he actually put me on subcontract. So I started that, hired a couple of guys. So then I was running my own. So I started a little company in Saskatoon mm. before I left there. Um, and then the next spring, Lauren called me back. The guy I worked for in Calgary said, it's getting really busy here. Do you want to come back? I'm like, hell yeah. So I brought my guys with me. No way. So the three of us packed our junk. <laughs> <laughs> what, were, what were you driving back then? Do you well, remember? I had a truck by then. What I, was I, it? I had like, a, a, like a GM. Yeah, okay. The actually GM diesel. I don't know if you were in 1980. <laughs> yeah. They had those converted diesels. I had one of those things <laughs> no, for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. So we packed our crap. We moved out here. That would have been, I guess, 87-ish. Yep. Just before the Olympics, yeah. And Lauren was a, a builder? What so was he? was he? a framing contractor. Okay. So we were working for kind of the big builders, a um, yep. bit of custom. So I ended up working for Qualico, actually, for a couple of years, subcontracted for them. And actually, they were, they were really good. Fox Ridge was kind of their upper end division. Hmm. So the houses were the same. It was just, again, turning over yep. product, turning over product. Um, going through, that, going through, sorry, going through developments? Were you literally like absolutely. working in a cul-de-sac and yep. just like... You betcha, yeah. Going around the circle? Round, 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 and a little bit of Shane Holmes, mm-hmm. you know, so kind of the big guys, they were all kind of busy at the time. That's yeah. where I met Dale, our current framer. Crazy. Was it Shane? Yeah. 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 It was kind of a, so you and your, the three of you? Yeah. Would just then blast around? A couple more guys came out, a couple more friends that I knew came out, and then, uh, so we were running, I ran a couple of crews for a while, we did a little bit of that. Actually, I ended up buying some equipment, was doing some landscaping, and just all kinds of just busy, 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 doing all kinds of stuff. So was it really going? Was the was the housing or the building market really on fire in it the was, late days? It was busy, yeah, yeah. It really was, and I think it was just beginning to pick up. Like things were just getting busy again. Was it anything? Because Olympics were '88. Absolutely, it was Olympics. I just that drove it. I was so sad they never really responded to the Olympic again this time. I'm yeah. like, man, that that really put Calgary in the map. And I could just remember the the atmosphere in the city was just electric. Like it was mm. so cool. Like. Mm. Everybody was, you know, just so excited to get these, you know, these events happening and all yep. these, the construction. So that really spurred a ton of construction work, mm-hmm. just the infrastructure, Giant and housing, just everything. Yep. Yeah. You, you look at what got built just for, just oh, for yeah. those, just that one Olympics. Yeah. And we have it today. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, a lot of it's getting pulled apart now, but, yep. you know, it's, it's amazing how much of that really benefited the city for all those mm-hmm. years, you know, really we, we missed the boat again yep. on this one, but you could see it like when you were, when things were ramping up for you right around that time, yep. there's a direct correlation. Well, with well, and I think it continued. Like, I really think that it put Calgary on the map. I think our current, or, or we'll say the, the current, we'll say city council at the time mm-hmm. was really good at promoting the city. Mm-hmm. They really put Calgary on the map for worldwide. People wanted to come here and live here. Yep. You know, and again, different times, different markets, you know, the oil industry was picking up, so that always helps too, right? Mm-hmm. So a little bit of everything was just a perfect storm of all of these things kind of happening at the same time, which yep. is people were just excited to move here. And it was fun. Like, it was just, it's like just a nonstop fun party. Like, it was just like... Who was, was it? Just, like, just everyone you came across was generally happy, so you the were. energy was up? Or you know like, what, what was it, it? And it was funny, when I, when I left Saskatoon, everything was a push. I worked for these, you know, builders that build four or five of these little crappy houses every year, difficult and miserable and you could barely i remember one guy used to just he'd bring you nails and he'd dump them in a bucket and it just drove me crazy said, just bring them in a box they're all lined up in a box simple little <laughs> things like that just bring the oh you're gonna wreck them if they're in the box in the bucket they're just like pickup mm-hmm. sticks right they're, they're just like tearing your heads everywhere. Apart. <laughs> I, I i just hated that guy with the passion he was so hard to work for mm-hmm. nothing was ever good enough he's building these like 800 square foot 900 yeah. square foot horrible little houses and i'm like ah. Oh. And like I said, the day Lauren called me, I'm like, I'm done. Done. <laughs> Out. I got to go. And we were working on probably 2,000 foot homes here. So twice as big, yep. big vaulted ceilings, you know, kind of the... What areas? Remember what uh, areas Actually, oh yeah, Edgemont. Uh, we were down in Woodbine quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, Douglasdale. Yeah. Areas like that. So we were kind of in, kind of the new areas, nice nice areas. Hawkwood. All new builds? Were they yeah. Kind of new? yeah. It was all new stuff, yeah. Hmm. yeah. I didn't get into rentals till till later, really kind of went through that whole new build phase. And then it just... It got more and more sporadic over the years, and the prices get, got squeezed more and more. Mm-hmm. Really, everybody was getting a little bit, I, maybe too many trades at the time. I, I don't know what it was. I think the market tightened up quite a bit too. Mm-hmm. So kind of mid-90s, it got a little bit funky, and that's about when we started to work more in inner city. So mm-hmm. I, I ran into who one of my friends, Chuck. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Chuck. Yeah, yeah, this yeah is you know term. Chuck. Good, seg- good segue, here's, buddy. Here's a Chuck story. <laughs> so... So that would have been 1990. So you're still doing... So we were, I was still framing. Is Ro, is it Rollick Developments now when you came to Calgary? Actually, it was Rollick uh, Construction. Okay. 
So and then we lost that for a while. I was I was Knight Homes for a while. Okay. And then Knightsbridge popped up about the same time and yeah. that didn't work out. We yep. were I'm a framing contractor and I was working for them too, which was really weird. <laughs> So Nights like, all okay, over. Yeah. We're talking about invoice <laughs> problems. <laughs> it's like, who's getting paid here? Yeah. Um, but then, and then actually that's about the time, yeah, I met with Chuck and we had started buying inner city. So I, kind of a friend of a friend, one of the guys that came here with me actually knew a guy that was developing inner city property. So I framed a house for him. Uh, Dave Zalewski was the guy's name. Yep. I think he's still doing bits and pieces, but mm -hmm. So he was, and I kind of got a little bit more interested in that. And then that's about the time so we bought a house in uh, Renfrew. Yep. So we put a second story on one of those wartime story and a half. So we added another floor. Mm -hmm. Well, added a roof. So yep. made it into a full two story. And then I hired Chuck to do the drywall. So that's where he came into the picture about 1990, 89, 90. When you put that second story on, was that, um, were many people doing that? Or was that a, was that a, was that a big... You know, big reno. You, it, people were doing that, but it was kind of a big reno. Like yeah. for me, it was so easy because we just peeled everything down to that. There was a second floor on the house already, yep. but they were small. Those houses were 600 square feet. Crazy. When we were down, it was like just over 1,200 square feet on two floors. Mm -hmm. They're tiny. It still had the octopus furnace in the basement. We tore all that out. I, mean, I can't even imagine how much asbestos that I've seen in my life. I don't want to talk about that right now, but you, know, you, you think about that, you're like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. That, not so smart, maybe. But, but it was just, kind of, but those houses were quite original. Like that one was maybe, maybe renovated kind of halfway, mm -hmm. but it was pretty original. So we cleaned it all up, yep. straightened it up, and then put that second, made it a full two story. And, and then, yeah, and then we sold that a while later. We stayed in there for a little while and then sold it. And then bought another, then we bought a lot from Dave, actually Zalewski off, just off Edmonton Trail yep. and built a new home. And, th and that, that change in thought process. Inner city. From working for somebody and like popping up, yeah. you know, new areas, yeah. you knew that there was something, this was a new opportunity or what did you see there? So, <laughs> and there's, there's so much crap. I, I was going at about a thousand miles an hour. So at this time I still had the Bobcat. I had equipment. Yep. So I ran into this landscaper dude. Iver. <laughs> so Iver hired me to do all of his wood walls. He ran into me. Karen was designing landscape at the time. Mm -hmm. So Iver sees me working on this job that she had gotten. So I'm doing all the construction work for them. Yep. And I'm building these wood walls. He stopped, just randomly stops by and says, hey, can you do the wood walls for me? I'll hire you with your machine. Come and do wood walls. So <laughs> as stupid as it was, I was framing during the day. And that's what I was doing on weekends and evenings. The moonlight. He's building walls and, mm -hmm. you know, grading yards and thinking that's really, really where I wanted to go was get into landscaping with equipment and stuff like no that. Way. Yeah, because really it was still construction. It was yep. still related. Just, just summers only, like, winters, so I could take the winters off. Right. It seemed like a pretty good yep. opportunity. Yep. Um, but then Ivor and I started talking about building homes. So we scrape our money together. Can we build a show home? So we actually, that's how Night Homes came about. What year is this? That would have been 88, 89. Hmm. Like really, I did a lot. Really? In three years... We did a lot. When I think about it now, yeah. I'm trying to place all this stuff. Mm. That all happened before 1990. Mm. I remember that very clearly. Like so that you was were, all just bang, 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 you bang, were going. bang, full speed. Mm -hmm. I had everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> How it all happened, but it all happened. Yep. It's just the experiences were so good. Like just kind of managing all of this, you know. So I had guys working for me on framing sites. We had you know two crews at the time. Yep. Plus the landscaping thing, and you know all of these things kind of stacked up together. They all tied together. It's really easy. Yep. And then you know we kind of started looking at doing the building thing, and I kind of gave up one of the better builders I ever worked for, which was Sundance, and I think they're still around. Uh, Wilf was a great guy to work for. Really, yeah. Just you know construction. Mm -hmm. like, he was a He's hardcore a construction yep. dude. <laughs> yeah. And I remember saying, oh, you you don't want to get into this business." I'm like, "Yeah, I do." He's no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be better off doing what you're doing, sell a house every few years and do your thing. Yep. Anyway, so <laughs> we thought, well, let's try this. Well, it didn't work out, and it was the best thing ever because Ivor was not, we'll say, not a very honest so you, businessman. You, you we never it? would have mashed. Okay. So, so we kind of walked away from that. In the meantime, after meeting Chuck, so this was all around the 89, 90, mm -hmm. he's like, well, actually, I, there's a really good contractor that needs a framer. They need a good framer. So we waltzed onto Riverdale Avenue and framed a big custom home for Hassel Construction. Hmm. So and Doug became one of our staple builders for years and hmm. really good friend. And just yep. we, he was he was the I want to say a turning point for me and my thinking process. And I want to say just high high level of quality, 
you know, just super, just a really good guy to work for. Yep. He was organized and he just, you know, kind of had it all going for him. Just mm. a really good guy. Good with the clients. Just just a good person to learn from. Mm-hmm. You watch that. That's how you want to do Pay it. Pay attention. That's, that's you know, and, and later on we both said we, sh- we should have partnered up a long time ago. Because then we kind of started doing more. Some of the builders, so that would have been, I would say, mid, you know, up to about 95, 96. Yep. But then I thought we had built a couple more of our own by then. And That's then th- that was always happening in the background? It was always happening in the background. You, this you, was after hours, like whatever else. You were buying, we buying lots yeah. or buying a project, renovating yeah. or tearing down and putting yeah. one up? Yeah, we did that and for, sell. Yeah, for a few years. When you're doing that. And, and I have to be careful, and you may have to edit this out. But There's no editing, by the re- way. Revenue, <laughs> <laughs> Revenue Canada me. They're, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're keen on this. But yeah, we, we did quite a few in a row. Yep. We'd buy, move in, yep. tear, move out, yep. tear them down, sell, or do, renovate them or do whatever. So we quote a few. The first real house we did would have been in 90, 95 or 96. We bought a lot in East Double Park. Hmm. So that was our first true spec house. Gotcha. So that one we bought. We actually lived there for a while, hauled the house away, and then turned that over as a, as a company project. Hmm. So that was the first one we actually did on spec properly. Yep. And we, we set a record of $680,000 for resale. That was a record. That was a for record? Spec house. Yeah. No way. Yeah. <laughs> like, think about that now you can't even touch a piece of dirt anywhere in the no. city for 600 mm-hmm. anything like it doesn't matter so, so it was really funny yeah just like that's what yeah crazy yeah. how big was it you remember yeah i remember no that was yeah, i'm sure well. I'm, I, I'm sure i can ask you <laughs> everything much, i pretty much touched every screen <laughs> so. was that a moonlighting job no that was we did that well actually no <laughs> that's not true i was still framing okay so and it was hassle that really said to me he's like you know what? That's good on you. He says, I wish I had the courage to do this. And he but, said it to me straight up. And I thought, I just, I didn't even think twice because, you know, again, the guy that I worked with in Humboldt, Tim, him and his brothers went off and started doing that. It was just, we're just building something. You have to go, you have to build. That's what we got to do. I was going to ask you about the, the, the risk of, of doing that. Yeah. Like it's a, you, there's a lot of well, outputs before I, anything comes back. I have a great story on that one. That was a really, so I had financing secured before we started. We had a, I guess, a, a builder's mortgage lined up. Yep. And the person I was dealing with decided to leave that bank and the bank wouldn't honor the deal. Hmm. So we had the building standing. So I had enough cash to get the building up. Yep. So my windows and doors are ready. And this is a long relationship with Calgary Sash. I remember phoning Ralph, who was, you know, Gord's dad at the time. I'm like, Ralph, <laughs> I haven't got money to pay you. And he's like, what's going on? I said, well, this is what happened. I said, no problem. I'm going to send you the windows. No way. I said, are you kidding me? I said, so again, lifelong relationship yeah. come out of that one. I'm like, yeah. you know, so I was loyal to them right till they closed the doors and mm-hmm. still very good friends with Gordon, you know, consider him truly my best friend. Like yep. he's just one of those guys that, but it's that alignment of values, right? Mm-hmm. You know, once you have the alignment of values with people like that, business is fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they, they got you. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's really something that, that was, I guess, again, just a turning moment. Okay, I've got good people that'll back us up. So yep. we ended up finishing that house. Mm-hmm. Again, got the financing. Mm-hmm. I broke a couple cell phones over the deals. <laughs> a few of them flew off roofs. And <laughs> there were some bad days there, but <laughs> you know, we got through it, got, got that one done. And then we turned around and did another one back to back. We bought a lot on Riverdale. We did another spec on Riverdale. Uh, and then it sold for somewhere in the mid nines and nine forty. Right. So that was a big jump. And this is under, under what company name now? So this would have been under Rollick, I think, now we're Rollick Developments again. Okay. And I can't remember when we switched back yep. and forth because we incorporated we incorporated in 89 as Night Homes. Mm-hmm. And I can't remember how long we kept that. But mm-hmm. it would have been somewhere in the yep. mid-90s, somewhere along the way. So, and yeah. and, and the, the did you view it as a calculated risk? I, I actually... Or, or, or just like, this is what I do and this is what's happening. This is, yeah, it was more like that. More, what's the worst case? We can move into it. Mm. You know, you kind of look at it, look at it as... You know, that situation. Yep. Um, worst case, we sell it at a loss and lose some money. Mm-hmm. Or we sell it at a profit and make some money. Yep. I mean, it's every business is based on that. It's mm-hmm. like we all hope that everything is going to go as planned or better. <laughs> yep. We all hope for the better scenario, but both those worked out pretty well. Hmm. And then, then the one on Riverdale, actually a client came to us 
that had looked at the house said, hey, can you build us a similar house on our lot? That's when That's a, really we started building. That I would say that was a turning point for us to really start building. So whatever money we made on that house was kind of irrelevant because yeah. many, many, many houses yeah. later, that's what started off for us. Did you know that's going to happen? No idea. Did, that was not the plan. So my plan was never to have clients. Never. You were just going to do spec. It was the best thing ever. So back to the water skiing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now we're going to now, now, now we can talk about some fun stuff. So at the time, it was it was a brilliant program. So we had Oliver about, uh, was 97. Okay. So when we built that house in um, East Elbow. So I remember he was coming to the job site in his little kid bucket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so was Karen bring donuts on the job site? By the way, no, never. No. My, that's, that's all we did. My mom, my mom, she and, brought the donuts. <laughs> yeah, we would always go to job sites, and yeah. Dad and his, his partner Ari, and yeah. me and my brother and my sister would be like rolling around this '79 Cutlass, and Mom would bring donuts <laughs> or cookies because she couldn't afford donuts. Yeah. So like we just feed Dad. whatever came out of the yeah, yeah. <laughs> the lunch just coming to the job totally. site. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not too much of that. We were pretty yeah. self-sufficient on the yeah, sites. <laughs> More specifications, product yeah. information. Mm -hmm. So Karen did a lot of that in the early days. Yep. And then, uh, so that that kind of where was I going with what, that? So you popped this thing up, and and it oh it yeah turns into so yeah. So Oliver was I think he would have been seven months old, I guess. Mm -hmm. So we finished that house. We sold it. Big house. Oh, that it was about twenty five hundred feet. So it was not big. You know, and then they asked us to develop the basement, so we finished the basement up for them. Yeah. But this is the funny part. So that fall, I'm like, okay, well, as soon as this house is done, we're going to Florida for a month and a half. Because of check? No. Nope. Okay. So you, were, you, weren't, you weren't skiing yet? Oh, yeah. Oh, I was going to ski. ski. Okay. Oh, yeah. No, I'd already been there a couple times. So <laughs> okay. I started going there in the early 90s. I started going to Florida. Okay. And, yeah, because I had, I think in 93, I bought my first boat. 92, 93, I bought my first boat. Where were you boat. skiing? Ghost, mostly. No way. Yeah. And what was the first boat? Uh, Malibu. Hmm. Yeah, it went straight. Well, Chuck had a Malibu at the mm -hmm. time and knew a guy in California, knew a guy that knew a guy. Same guy. He said, hey, you got a boat? Yeah, I got a boat for you. So I drove down, me and a buddy drove down no to California, way. turned around and drove right back. <laughs> <laughs> so I bought a, a bright, shiny red Malibu skier. So no way. New, yeah. And skied a ghost yeah. often? Lots. Like? Like four or five times a week. No way. Yeah. Oh, so heavy. After work, mm -hmm. Scotty and I would load up our crap. Mm -hmm. The boat was ready. We were like, it was just, it was like a synchronized swimming team. Mm -hmm. Like, draw, I remember launching the boat and, and getting in and out. And it was hilarious because we'd, we'd backed out the ramp. One guy would be in the boat and mm -hmm. same loading up again. You mm -hmm. backed down the ramp before the truck stopped. The boat would be on the trail. You'd be out of there. People were just like, <laughs> they could, these they, guys? <laughs> it's like, well, we just did this yesterday. <laughs> and the day before. And the day before. <laughs> we, we've done this 15 times already in the, in the first two weeks of the month. So it's pretty funny. What, what, what got you into water skiing? Actually, it was Chuck. It was. Fully. Uh, I had, I always loved the water from the time I was a little kid. I remember going anywhere on the holidays, anywhere by the water. Yep. Uh, we used to spend a couple of weeks every summer in the Okanagan by Salmon Arm in, in canoe. Mm -hmm. It was all about the lake, the lake, the lake, the lake. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't get enough of it. Yep. Didn't it really never scratch that itch. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like, Dad, I had a boat like when I was a kid, but really by the time I was old enough to do anything with it, he was terrified of the water. Yep. So that's kind of a weird story because he had a, I don't know why he had a boat. He was terrified of the water, but he used to water ski. No way. You get the big puffy orange jacket on and there's two Viking, Viking, I remember this to this day, Viking water skis. <laughs> I, I don't know if we ever got a picture of it, but it was, I just, I will never, ever forget that look. It's burned in your mind. Yeah, burned in my mind. And that's the very first time I ever was on water skis, was on those Viking skis <laughs> at Redberry Lake in the middle of nowhere, Saskatchewan, Crazy. very close to where I grew up, <laughs> about a half an hour north and. Just, you know, and I kind of, and I rate that, you knew? that time I knew, like, I, I love this and I could never get enough of it because mm -hmm. they didn't, we didn't really go to the lake. We go to BC for holiday. Yep. And lots of our friends would have co cottages and little cabins all over the place. And mm -hmm. my nephew actually just bought one of our friend's cabins, which is really cool. So I was there this summer skiing on that <laughs> lake, which is pretty cool. <laughs> Back to the beginning again. <laughs> but I never really touched that for a long time again until, again, Chuck and I came across each other and he was heading out to BC and I'm mm -hmm. like, does he want to come? And, you know, Chuck's just such an open, honest guy. He's like, yep. hey, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing a thousand things, but mm -hmm. started going out there with him. A um, couple of years, I guess, we drove back from a lot. May Long Weekend was a thing. We started going to Maple Lake, and I guess that was August Long Weekend. Yeah. We'd go there, like, we just back and forth, back and forth, back Skiing. and forth, hauling boats, hauling boats, hauling boats. And I then he got a ski boat. Then he got a real, like a the Malibu, and yep. we got off the outboards and into the Malibu, and I was mm -hmm. like, oh, this is even better. 
And then I tried barefooting. No way. That Behind that thing? got me so hooked. Actually, no, it was a guy in Saskatoon. Like a flat bottom or what did he have? He had an old Nautique with a no 454 way. in it. Hmm. Like the old 2001s, they were really skinny little boats yeah. with a 454 in it. And so that, was rockets. The, that was the big block in the old, I don't know if you ever saw a picture of Nautique made a boat exactly like that. They called it the barefoot. And mm-hmm. a big barefoot stamped on the side instead of not oh, I remember. Yeah. And that got you hooked? That got me Barefooting? Hooked. I was like, I can't, I just can't get enough of this. No way, I man. I couldn't, I couldn't get enough. <laughs> that, <laughs> up to then, this uh, slalom's okay. This is all good. This is all good. And I was just like. Barefoot. Yeah, absolutely. Just inside out. I couldn't, couldn't mm-hmm. get enough of that. So. What, did, did you barefoot on Ghost? Yeah, oh yeah. No way. Yeah. Would you barefoot more than slalom? I hardly saw him then. No way. Hardly. You were just a barefoot dude? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Forwards, backwards. There's no <laughs> way. On your butt, spin Forward. around, stand up. <laughs> All the crazy stuff. No yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. And those boats could, obviously, they were going fast enough, like that Malibu really, would go. Yeah, you only needed about, I didn't, I needed about 38 miles an hour at the time. So mm-hmm. I didn't need to go that fast. Well, so they go about 45. So yeah, Okay. So they're still. Yeah. So really, unless... Typically, you know, 40, 42. Yeah. Because the old, the old legend used to be at 45, you had to go at least 45 miles an hour. And I watched so many guys try and step off a water ski at 45 miles an hour. It's hilarious. Oh, it's, <laughs> I'm just, just like, like, what are you thinking? Like, really? Would you really, really think this? this <laughs> have you thought this whole thing through? I got this. <laughs> oh, no, I don't. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, that kind of just got me wound up. And then, I don't know, I guess probably two years later, I kind of got tired of that and then started the slalom course. Mm. And that's a totally and different... And then that was, that was an addiction times two. It was mm-hmm. just holy smokes. like, mm-hmm. And that's when, I want to say, must have been... That was still early 90s. They had a lot of stuff in those few years. Yeah, you I were, would say that, that six or seven year span, I can't imagine... I don't even think I slept. I couldn't have. No. Just there was Starting just, a family. There was stuff stacked up. And so much skiing. going on. Well, it was actually before Oliver when I started skiing. Yeah. So I was early 90s so you still. Were, you weren't quite. I wasn't quite there yet. <laughs> Late 90s, we had the kid. <laughs> so the boy came later. But it was really interesting. We were, just so, we were so busy doing, we'll say, houses. Then we go to Florida. Mm-hmm. So I started going to, Ma- I went to Maple's school like the first time ever. And that was early, right? I didn't really know who he was. Was he in the magazine? He was in the magazine, but actually I was trying to go to Robert's, but they were booked up. Mm. It was kind of early January, and I think a lot of places were closed. A lot mm-hmm. of places don't even stay open in January. Yep. And Andy and Dina were running the school, and they're like, yeah, come on down. Come ski with us. So it was those two and Ben Favre, who was, again, a pro skier at the time. I had really no idea who Andy, Andy Mapple was. Mm-hmm. I just remember being there. Like, this is the first time I'd ever gone to a ski school, barely, barely skied in the course at all. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, I'm going to go learn how to do this, right? And then I start watching these guys ski the course. Oh my lord! There we go. <laughs> this looks really cool, but boy, oh boy, I'm not anywhere close to that good. <laughs> I, remember, I remember this clearly. It was just howling wind one day, so they had two courses on that little lake, mm-hmm. which is Hancock. Okay. So, so they had a course this way, a course this way. So they had two of them kind of on each shore. So this one was like blown out. Like I'm not kidding you. Knee high white caps. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're not skiing today. So, so, <laughs> so Andy jumps in the boat. He takes off to the other side of the lake. Comes back, yeah, skiable. Well, they were ankle high white caps. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. And I mean, that's how that guy learned to ski. Like he'd ski anything. And mm-hmm. you watch him in tournaments for all those years. Yep. Doesn't matter. Care. Just mm-hmm. figure it out. Just mm-hmm. go out there and do it. And that was just so inspiring watching those two. I was just like, wow, like this is so again. The addiction was just like wrapped up. <laughs> and what part of the addiction is it? What, like, what is it about slalom skiing that, that actually got your attention? At, like, I think it was goals and the challenge. Yeah. And it's so, it's, it, well, I say it's, we'll, we'll chat about the, the racing thing after. And, but the challenge of it, and it's so clean and pure. Mm-hmm. It's you. Yeah. You have nobody else to blame. Yep. If you blow up, it's your own fault. Mm-hmm. You know, it's rare that a boat driver will actually wreck your run. Yeah. Although there's been a lot of boat drivers yelled at. <laughs> we, we've all yelled at boat drivers before. But it's really interesting that it's, you know, really it comes down to you. So when you compete in that arena, yep. it truly is you. Mm-hmm. There's no teammates to blame. There's nobody else to blame. Mm-hmm. If you didn't train properly, if you make a mistake, it's all you. Yep. But it was such a clear, there's such a clear definition of success. And it just, you're measured. Absolute hard yep. measurements. Yeah. You know, and I, I jumped for a while. It was the same thing. How far did you go? Mm-hmm. There you go. There's your number. Yeah. 
There's Here's no your debates. number. There's no, there's no debate. There's no judging. I didn't like Trick very much because it was all judging. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, totally. I don't need to be judged. <laughs> this is what I, I do. I get judged everywhere else. Like, I'm going to come do something that's clean and pure. Yeah. And and that that passion, that addiction lasted, you know, and, and where did you end up competing? Long time. Uh, I'm, I'm Location-wise, almost everywhere in Canada. And and the levels of competition? Well, to nationals. Yeah, so yeah, Canadian nationals. nationals. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so really from West Coast, East Coast. Yeah. Uh, the only place I don't think I skied was in uh, Winnipeg. I never mm -hmm. skied there. But yeah, Hallsville, way in New Brunswick. Was, it was, is yeah, it always? Nova Scotia, I should say. Yeah. Oh, you're like yeah. all the way over. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, we skied in uh, Dartmouth. Mm -hmm. Right down. That was my first nationals. I blew up at ball one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the trip. Again, <laughs> my, my fault, not theirs. <laughs> yeah. Has it always been a, a very underground sport? Like back then, you yeah. know, I'm sure your circle is, you know, surrounded by water skier so it didn't feel like so underground but you know looking back on it now is it well you know the, the cool thing was is I, I became I say very good friends with Carl Robert we really we we're kind of about the same age yep. and you know I, I went there a lot like I spent a lot of time there like you know for for several years I go there when we go down our, our month month and a half stints we go there every day I was there five days a week and I'd ski in the morning go back in the afternoon we'd go do something else for the afternoon and just to get better right just to get better yeah and really it, it, be, it became more of a just hanging out with friends thing because I could mm. do little projects for them. We'd trade work and mm. I'd just be skiing. Cool. Like just one of the guys and, you know, yep. got to meet this crazy Australian guy, which you've probably heard of Big Dave. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he grew up pretty Big Dave, but again, we got along good because I didn't put up with much of his crap and mm -hmm. whatever, whatever. <laughs> you know, I didn't really care. <laughs> says, whatever, Dave. Mm. But really, you know, probably one of his true, one of the people he actually got along with. Mm. So really that was kind of a, and, then, and honestly, I, I met so many people there, Jeff. Like, I'm on just about every European, the whole French team would show up there. Mm -hmm. So, we, you know, I'd meet all these pro French team guys. Italians were all there. Like, a lot of the Europeans came to Robert. Mm -hmm. He had a nice little lake. He had a great jump site because Carl was a jumper. Mm -hmm. So, Carl had two slalom courses. Yeah, two. And then he had a, a good jump course. Mm -hmm. So, the lake was well set up for that. So a lot of those guys would come there, they could trick because it was a, a natural lake. Yep. So there's lots of space. And just the program was it was just fantastic. I mean, I watched so many people ski. It was mm. just amazing. So inspiring. I was like, I know these guys do it full time. They're probably 10 years younger than me at the time. I was in my early 30s. They're all in their 20s. I've yep. been skiing since they were little kids. The Europeans all got paid a wage. Mm. It was amazing. They all got paid 30, 40 grand a year to ski. So cool. They're making Amazing. a living doing this. Yeah. The Canadians, like you know, that's about when I met Trent. Was it was down there? Mm -hmm. Met a buddy from Saskatchewan in Florida. Oh, of course, <laughs> of course. The water, water exactly. ski world. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. We all piled up in, in the same site, and it was just interesting watching him trying to become pro mm -hmm. versus all these other guys that were getting paid a salary just yep. to be there. I remember one Italian guy, Kiko. I mean, he'd show up there every year and living the life of a king because his parents were fairly well off. He's mm -hmm. getting a wage. Skiing, <laughs> skiing, hanging out by lake. What a lifestyle, man. Golf a little bit in the afternoons. It was just like, wow, you guys have it made. Figured out. Yeah. It, the, <clears throat> the amount of time you you spent skiing, getting, you know, skiing nationals and, you know, playing at a high level. It, what is it? Is it just for that personal satisfaction of getting to the next level, to, to accomplish the next goal? Like what, what is it that kept you active for so long in that sport? I, th I think that was it. Just, just it was a personal thing because, you know, I don't know anybody that knows water skiing probably has heard of Bruce Dodd, but he was always either in my age division or just mm -hmm. we were always overlapping each other. Mm -hmm. So I was basically always even at a provincial level skiing against a pro skier. Yep. So I, I erased that from my mind right away. So it all it came about really came down to me. Mm -hmm. Can I go out there and perform? You know, if I can run a set pass, can I go out there and perform that in a tournament? Mm -hmm. And do it day after day after day. Yep. And that's something I learned from Robert. He's like, go out and practice like you're in a tournament. Mm -hmm. Run down the line and then go backwards. Yep. Then, go, then go practice after that for your second set. But he said, every time you get in the water, he said, that's it's worked for me for years. And I was like, so I got a lot of little things like that. Mm -hmm. But he said, really, you know, for a guy that's got a full-time job yeah. on the side, he said, you know, you're doing well. Yeah. <laughs> and, and in those days, mm -hmm. I think today... If I, if I put that time and energy in, I would for sure ski further down the line. There's no question. Mm -hmm. Given the, I want to say video, that's yep. so developed Tech, now compared yeah. to what it was. Yep. I mean, man, we hardly watch video. Mm -hmm. 
if you got to photograph of yeah, yourself, that was amazing. Yeah. But, you know, you have some dude in the boat that may or may not give you good direction. Mm-hmm. And Carl was a terrible coach. Mm. Terrible coach. Mm. Great, great guy, but yeah. fun guy. I had a lot of fun there, but not a good coach. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I wish I could just go do it. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I wish you could too, Carl. <laughs> how yeah. do you, how'd you balance it? Because I, I obviously I know the, you know, when you and I met at a water ski club and you and I put in the same amount of time, the balance between running your business and having this, uh, it's like an all-consuming athletic passion. Yeah, yeah. How'd you balance it for so many years? It come back to that energy piece. You were just after, after wired. I, I, seriously, I would be I would frame all day, and then yep. five thirty, six o'clock, we'd knock off, and I would drive to the ski lake. Mm-hmm. I meet Scott. We'd run our couple sets. Yep, that's it. That's it. Put it on. The repeat. only time I really, I'll say, truly took time off work was just before a tournament. I may take a couple of days off. Yep, but even that was rare. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I'd ski Saturday, ski Sunday. You know, generally four to five days a week. I didn't over ski, mm-hmm. but. You know, and I knew, I learned how to train from those guys. Hmm. I, really, that was what I watched more, more than anything. Yep. They didn't ski themselves to death. They're like, go out there and work on something. Go out there and yep. practice something. Don't go out there and just beat yourself up. So there was a little bit of, we'll say, once I started skiing at the club, and it was more of a controlled environment, mm-hmm. it didn't matter when you went. Yeah, You didn't have to go ski five sets because it was good today. Mm-hmm. You'd come and ski your two sets, go home, yep. work on it. Which... Paradise that close to home, hey? I know it was pretty good. Yeah, mm-hmm. still yeah. is pretty good. Yeah, we're yeah. spoiled. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that was a lucky thing. And in, and even that that was uh, that was an ambitious call. And I'm going to take credit for it. Rick called John Kittler from uh, Rick, Hyper. Rick Allsip called John Kittler at the water ski store. Mm. And I'd been doing some stuff with John. We fiddled around with water ski equipment for a while. Okay, I thought I wanted to get into retail. That's a terrible mistake. Good. <laughs> not, a re- not a good retail guy. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I can picture you sitting behind the counter. No, listening can you help to, me try on this? Listening uh, to stories. Of, oh, yeah, well, I got a boat. It's like, oh, my, no, no, no. That was not a good job. <laughs> it was better that I left that whole game. Play to your strengths. <laughs> yeah. But John called me out of the blue and says, because we, we started skiing out at Rocky View, and I don't know if you've ever been there. But Never it's, have. It is tough. Mm-hmm. It's out in the middle of, it's part of the irrigation, so they didn't start till maybe June, if you're lucky. Yep. Maybe late May. But yep. Weedy, nasty, mm-hmm. flow through. All of it. All of the above. Couldn't be much more challenging. But mm-hmm. anyways, um, it was better than Ghost. Yep. Way better. The boat was Closer, there. warmer. Absolutely. The water was way warmer and yeah, it was way better. And yep. Met some great people there. Yep. So yeah. So that was all good. But then out of the blue, Rick calls John and John calls me and says, hey, you want to go talk to this guy? He's going to build a ski lake. I'm like, really? Interesting. So I go down. I'm like, this is a really a nice spot. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't really believe that he was going to get it done. Could you picture it? Looking yeah. back on it now, oh, you could, yeah. his idea made sense. And the, Absolutely, the, because the, he had dug about a third of it already at the, we'll call it the river end. Yep. I guess the east end. Mm-hmm. So he had dug about a third of it out, proved that there was water flowing through there. Mm-hmm. So really, or groundwater. So then really it was just a matter of, I'm going to dig from here to there, the fence line. We walked it all. Yep. Had a really good conversation. He says, well, can you put together a ski club? And I'm like, well, I knew Valsic at the time and Bill Conrad and Scott. I can't remember who all was. Chuck else around? Was. Chuck was, he did, he did join, but he wasn't really super keen on the club thing. Yep. No time and yep. it just didn't, didn't make sense for him. So, so I started calling all those guys. So Chuck and I weren't really skiing much anymore because I was, I, get in, I got in up to here mm-hmm. like usual. You're like way in. <laughs> way in. And Chuck's like, it's not fun anymore. <laughs> you're, you're getting crazy, man. See <laughs> what we got to do. <laughs> I'm just going to relax and do a few turns out at Calabaca yep. Lake. <laughs> so so we, we started trying to figure this stuff out. And then I, I didn't really see eye to eye. Rick, Rick and I didn't see eye to eye. Yep. So, so I kind of stepped back and... That's when Valsvik took over <laughs> 20, 22 years later. So I continued to ski at Rocky View for a while. Mm. And then they kept working, kept working, because nobody else that, that was in, Scott and I were skiing at Rocky View, and that was about it. Mm. Wentworth was there at the time. Mark yep. was always there. Uh, Jansen. No way. Ross Dixon. Mm. Those guys were all from Rocky View. No way. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's how I know all those guys. No yeah. way. So Brenton. And uh, Russ used to come in and just ski. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like Scott and I. We'd just come in and pound in our sets and leave. Yep. You need to dry rock, I'll stay and drive for you. But I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm busy. <laughs> it's like really miserable, really kind of arrogant. But, yep. time, but it was about time. And you ask about time management. Mm-hmm. We had, we'd have a window of two hours and we'd go pound in our sets and go home. Mm. And that's what I 
don't like about the current Predator Bay, you can't go down there and ski in two hours anymore. Yeah. I, uh, the booking system probably works really well. Yeah. But that's why I kind of had to stop because I yep. couldn't go down and wait for four or five yep. hours. Uh, this is no fun. Mm -hmm. I'm as well go. I got lots of other stuff to do. So. Yep. So that, but that's what you really used to work well is go down with your buddy, bang bang. Yep. Go home. Go. So that, that kind of worked. But anyway, so that, that that all got started. I'm just trying to remember even. It was when. 25 years ago this year. Yeah, really. So like this is the anniversary year. So really, would have been about the time we had Oliver <laughs> and it, all that was happening at about the same time. And I was, yeah, it worked out really well. I mean, mm -hmm. I spent a lot of my life there, mm -hmm. a lot of it. But skiing was the best thing ever. I mean, I've skied all over the freaking planet. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. <laughs> you know, the, the, the places you go because you're doing something, right? Yeah. And that's something I would say to anybody. Like, if there, if there's a, if you have a passion, it doesn't matter where you go. You run into other people mm -hmm. with that passion. If you go do something. Yeah. Do you rather? Do you like traveling like that versus just going for sitting around? Do you like traveling with a reason versus? You know, I like I, I like culture, and it's really kind of weird. I don't know. You, I'm sure you know who Anthony Bourdain is, but yep. I watched a special on him on his life story yesterday. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, you know what? Uh, that's what I loved about that show was he would actually talk to people. Mm. He was like, he'd get himself into the culture. Yep. And I would say that's my favorite way to travel if you can. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's really what like we we almost moved to Florida. I really got to know the people so well that. Man, this is like we had a house there. Like we were, <laughs> there was there was a it was a, there was just a weird circumstance here that changed the story. Yep. Otherwise, we would be, we Gone. would be there right now. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it was that close. Crazy. It was just like, isn't it crazy how a sport can turn into? It could have turned into a like a life. It it truly is, and it, it's kind of one of those weird things that, or it can it can pull your life right? right. And I mm -hmm. guess really that's, you know, that's the cool part. Like going to Louisiana. Like, yep. why would you go to Louisiana, Jack? Mm -hmm. Of all the places mm -hmm. on the planet. Mm -hmm. Is it Covington? I think it's Covington. Yeah, that's down there. Yeah. So so I went to a big dog tournament with Todd and all those guys as a little dog skier because there was there was all the pro guys yep. and then there was a few of us that wanted to ski a Class C tournament. Mm -hmm. So we went and skied a Class C. I mean, why would you do that? Okay. <laughs> you, know? you don't. But, but it was great because I got to see, really got into New Orleans, got to see... You really all of that little and that slice of culture going mm -hmm. to some going to an event like mm -hmm. that was spectacular. Well, you're you're surrounded by like-minded people. And Absolutely, the, ener the energy just it must come up. It's easy, right? Yeah. You got some you got something to yeah. start that conversation. So it was really mm -hmm. you know got to watch the fish fry and mm -hmm. you know all of that mm -hmm. culture was mm -hmm. just there. Yeah, and that's just what they do. So you go see a slice of life that. You'd never repeat. You that's couldn't all, repeat it. Yeah, it's very authentic and yeah, just like absolutely. Yeah. You can't pay for it. It's just another weekend for them. Okay, look, <laughs> you know? There was some Canadian guys with us now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on in. <laughs> you know, and the hospitality. You know, and, I, and I've always said that about. You know, really, I think the Americans have us hands down for hospitality. Yeah, it's way different. And just getting back from there, mm -hmm. it didn't matter what state. We were in seven states. Mm -hmm. It was it's the just, same everywhere. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter where you just went. Happy. Right from Denny's to mm -hmm. high end restaurant. It doesn't matter. It's mm -hmm. just. Just a different mindset. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't, I don't know why or what or whether it's a false. I don't know. You know, mindset or you know because you're in the service industry or whether it's just, but you, you just talk to people. Yeah. Randomly. Yeah. For no reason, like, I don't know. <laughs> it's just different. It is a different swing. Yeah. Yeah. How do um, how did you weave in the racing? <laughs> this is this is obviously another another piece of the equation. Another little sidebar. <laughs> yeah, like it, th yeah. there's lots going on, but the racing thing. You know, yeah. you talked about it at the very beginning. It's just that mechanical side and exactly. Being around. And I guess the the car thing has <clears throat> never gone away. So I've always had, Something. you know, always loved vehicles and, yep. and really whether it was a spell of trucks for a while and then whatever. If it's got a motor, I'm pretty happy. You're, you're, <laughs> you know, really, that's figure, yeah. where it all starts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I guess really the interest in how they work. You know, that, that's half of what drives me is like, how does this stuff work? So really, just again, Gord, Calgary Sash, you know, he invites me to a track night in Calgary. and At Ray City? At Ray City, yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's like, let's, you know, we want to come do some laps. Because, you know, he's kind of getting into it. And I was like, oh, okay, sure, come on, come on down. So I'm <laughs> like, uh oh I, it wasn't long after that, and I had a sports car. <laughs> did, you, did you know when you got to the track that you were in trouble? I had no idea. Oh. I got in the car. Then you knew you were in then trouble? I knew in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. I think we were a lot too, and I'm like, oh, this is a problem. <laughs> I just knew. Just all of it. Right away. It was, you know, because I've always loved, I want to say, the driving aspect. Yep. You know, and I, you know, you know, I had cars for a long time when I was a kid. Yep. And I got into trucks for work and stuff, but 
always had a passion to have a car. And then that was just like, okay, well, this is really good now. So we started doing autocross right away. No way. So I had I had bought a 911, like an older 99, I think it was. Mm-hmm. So he's like, oh, there's a red, red deer is holding, holding an autocross. You want to come up and do that? I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> just, you know, I'm not skiing this weekend. Let's go no race. No idea. Like just, you know, <laughs> just those weird things that kind of happen yep. across your path. And I, you know, again, let's go compete. We're competing. And, and, and that, that's all time-based. It doesn't <clears> matter. You can blame everybody else, but... If you drive well, you get good times. If you drive poorly, <laughs> you don't. And there's a big clock that tells you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yep. That drive, that internal drive to compete and to perform, just who you are mm-hmm. in everything. Yep. Period. Yep. Yep. So the racing, just everything, just clicked. It did. It, it, it does, and it still does to this mm-hmm. day because there's still that. What what I what I'm really bothered by is when the playing field is not even. Uh, so that's something that will drive me crazy. Just based on like, if everyone has to have the same spec. Yeah. Then they take out those variables, and it's just all the driver. Yeah. So I, I like spec racing. Yep. And the version we're doing in BC is a real watered down version of spec racing because they're allowing several different types of cars in. Yep. The parameters aren't clear. So so it's really hard to different change. weight wheelbases. Yeah. Mode, so like, I don't really know how well I'm doing. I guess. So right. what I'm trying to do is say, okay, well these guys have cars that are very similar to mine. Yep. So I'll I'll just in my mind I race against them. Yep. And if I can beat that group, then yep. I'm winning. Gotcha. Or if I'm number two or number three, I know where I stand. Yep. So if somebody in a what I perceive as a faster vehicle, mm-hmm. like and there are a few. Yep. And 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 they beat me. I'm kind of okay. I'm still number one in my division. Yep. So and so that's works. kind of spec racing. Mm-hmm. I mean, IMSA. Everybody else does that too. The only true, I mean, NASCAR is very tight. Mm-hmm. I, and I and I I don't like watching NASCAR, but that's something that I get why they do what they do because those cars are tight, man. Like, yep. The teams that spend more money just spend more time developing the car. Mm-hmm. Totally. And the same as Formula One, they spend more time developing the car. Yeah. Because you can't, it's not like you can have 80 or 100 or 200 more horsepower. Mm-hmm. You can't have more motor, but you can spend more time developing that yep. car. So. And that's how, yeah, that's how it works. Down to the, down to the mm-hmm. little, little details. And that's what, and then driving. You got to drive. That really comes down to driving, which is. That's, that's the talent, the, right? That's the passion. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that. Do you think you, the way you operate, the, you know, competing and performing, and do you, do you feel like you get to a certain, a certain spot and you're like, okay, I've accomplished something and I can now move on? Or is it, are these things that you, that you, these sports that you'll carry on for as long as you possibly can? Like, do you need to go find something else? That's a good question. Um, I think there's a, Probably a little bit of that, a little bit of find something else. <laughs> Surfing's in the... Oh, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, the wheels are already rolling. <laughs> rolling. That one's kind of got me just in the back of my mind. There's, that's still floating around out there. Uh, back to the water. I, mm-hmm. I just have this this draw to water. Yeah. I, I can't explain that one. Yeah. But <laughs> I get it. Probably growing up in the prairies, that does it to most of us. <laughs> Where's the lake, please? Just give me some water. <laughs> Go dry and crispy. Totally. But I think... The racing, I think, will keep me very interested for a long time because there's so many different types of, we'll say, really cars, events. Yep. You know, even I, I got lucky, I think I told you maybe, but I was in Phoenix. So there's a track there that's kind of affiliated with the one we belong to in BC. Yep. So I've kind of touched base with them out of the blue and cool. they put me in a car. Perfect. Here, go run some laps. Again, it's just like you're surrounding yourself with these like... Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And the guy got along and then I started reading the resume of the guys that are teaching there and I'm like, oh my. <laughs> this these is like different. 24-hour <laughs> Daytona guys, IMSA guys. Like These are all like top-notch mm-hmm. drivers that are their instructors. And I'm just mm-hmm. like, well, that was really cool. And the lead instructor is like top dog of a whole bunch of like high-end pro racing. Mm-hmm. Just the nicest guy on the planet. Mm-hmm. You know, really, he takes me for a couple laps in his car and... He says, well, I'll just throw you in this new Lexus and you can just follow me for a couple laps. And we're out there, tires squealing, brakes are smoking. It's just like, Crazy. whatever, man. Come on, let's go. <laughs> you know, it's just that, just that kind of thing just thrills me when you kind mm-hmm. of have, and I don't know if, you know, they trust because of where I'm from. Maybe. Or whether it's just uh, that's how they operate. Again, the hospitality thing, mm-hmm. a little bit of both. Mm-hmm. But it was just like, wow, like this is just so fun. I said, Karen, I'd never, ever guessed that I'd be driving a car today. Especially one of theirs. <laughs> you know? I see, you know, kind of ride-alongs or, you know, whatever. But yeah. no, it's just so cool. It's a, it's interesting to hear the story because it's, it's, it's the exact same story as the water ski thing. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Like you, you fall. You ski? 
<laughs> How many times you heard that? Yeah, totally. <laughs> you show up at a lake somewhere, and it's like, totally. yeah, you start chatting, and it's like, got your ski? Yep. <laughs> but it, it's it's very interesting. You you go you have these passions, and then it just they they build a community, and you just get access, and it's just yeah. it's just an interesting way to travel and see things and experience things. It is, and you and you kind of just yeah. It, again, it's just a it's an easy door to kind of open and mm. and have a chat with people. Yep. So yeah, it's just, yeah. Yeah, because if you're a racer, if you're a skier, it's a very kind of niche market. Yeah, it's not that many people you yeah. can actually mm -hmm. relate to. It's, yeah, it's kind of hard. Yeah. 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 So yeah. all of a sudden, if they if they know that you're that person, it's it's a pretty quick fit. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Which yeah. is cool. Yeah. Um, cool conversation, man. I think you and I could talk for hours, which we usually do. Probably could. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we should put yeah. a bow on this sucker. Sure. Um, the only question I ask my guests is, when I say Calgary, where does your head go? You know, I guess from the very beginning, I just felt a a strong bond with Calgary. I guess that's really probably the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. Very like-minded people, very, you know, and I'm, I'm hoping we're going to get some more of that again, really a little bit more of that you know, an entrepreneurial spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, really get you it. You felt that early? Get it done the day I walked in, the very first job set I walked on to, the very first time I ever, ever started working here. It was mm -hmm. just between the suppliers, the people I worked with, that just happened immediately. Mm -hmm. And it's never really changed. Mm. There's still a lot of really, really good, strong people out there that I think, I just hope we don't lose that. Yep. I really do. That's still cool. It's keeping me here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no reason to leave yet. <laughs> so, no, it's, it's really good. So, mm. yeah. Interesting. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Thank you. Now you got a lot going on. Um, this has been a fun conversation just to kind of hear the backstory of you know where, how it all came to be because yeah. really like we talked about off camera usually people only know the the tail end of somebody right right we're all yeah. developments they yeah. just build big giant homes and but they don't know how it all came to be so yeah this was a cool one cool so thank you thanks it was fun cool <laughs> <laughs>